So we're talking today about sharing our story. And if you don't have one of these cards, if you'll raise your hand, I know that we will have the ushers pass one of these out to you. We've got some more in the back. And basically, it's writing out your story. And, and that's what Christmas is all about. You say, what's Christmas about? Well, it's about life change. Uh, that's why Jesus came. Uh, the shepherds are tending the flocks out by the, in the fields of Bethlehem by night. And an angel comes to them and says, a Savior has been born to you, a Savior. When Jesus is describing his mission in Luke 19 10 he says the son of man I he says have come to seek and to save the lost here is why I've come I've come to save you from sin and death I have come to give you new life I have come to drastically and radically change you from the inside out that's why he came and that was his mission that still is his mission and if you have been saved uh, and the word saved means healed delivered and made whole all three of those things if this has happened to you and you now have new life in Christ now you have a story to tell and now you join Jesus in his mission and this is why we exist we have now the same mission statement that Jesus had when he said I've come to seek and to save the lost now our hearts now break for those who are far from God that's that's why we're here so today j just a story and and then we're gonna hear another story from someone in this church about how God has drastically changed their life but let's look at a story in John 4 if you've got a Bible, turn to John 4, and I, and I want to look at Jesus' mission, how he lived it out, and by the way, how he calls us to live it out as well. And as you go through John 4, I want to make uh, just four statements, four truths in John chapter 4, and the first truth is this, he meets me where I am. Listen to John 4, beginning with verse 4. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. No, no, he didn't. The, the, there were well-traveled paths around Samaria. Jews did not go into Samaria. They, they stayed away from, they avoided at all costs. But Jesus had to go through Samaria, not geographically. He had to go through Samaria because there was a woman dying on the inside that he had to go meet. Jesus had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noontime. Your translation might say the sixth hour, which makes sense because they count the hours after the sun comes up. The sixth hour is high noon. Why is that important? Because this is the desert. <laughs> no one goes outside at high noon, and we'll come back to that. Verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now let me make a couple quick points here. First of all, she is there at noontime. Uh, the only reason anyone goes outdoors at noontime in the Middle East in the desert is to avoid people. <laughs> and, and, and if you want to go draw water, you go early in the morning, you go late at night. You, you don't go at high noon in the heat of the day. But this woman does. Why? Because she doesn't want to be around the people. Probably she hears the whispers. She hears the talking. She hears people pointing and, and saying and, uh, and saying things behind her. She's tired of it, I believe. And so she goes at noontime. Second point is notice that Jesus breaks through some pretty intense barriers in order to make it to this woman. He breaks through a racial barrier, a gender barrier, and a social barrier. Let, let me just describe these three. First of all, a racial barrier. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They didn't talk. They wouldn't talk. There, there was a long, centuries-long animosity and tension between these two peoples. They, they did not like each other. They despised each other. And so they avoided each other at all costs. But yet Jesus has to go through Samaria because, because the, these silly barriers that the culture puts up and society puts up, Jesus breaks them down. And it's not just racial barriers, but it's also gender barriers. Men didn't speak to women publicly. It was forbidden for a rabbi to speak to a woman, even his own mother, in public. But here Jesus goes and strikes up a conversation, not just with any woman, but a Samaritan woman, and that leads to the third barrier that Jesus breaks down, and it's a social barrier. People of good reputation didn't talk to people of bad reputation. You know, I'm, I'm better than you. I'm, I've, I'm, I'm closer to God than you. I don't want to have anything to do with you because you're, you're dirty, basically. But Jesus doesn't care about that barrier either. And he ends up speaking to this woman who probably has one of the worst reputations in 
Samaria. But this is why he came. He came to seek her out. He came to, to, to chase her down, so to speak. That there's a verse in Psalm 23 where it talks about God being our shepherd and how he leads us and he, he, he restores us and he prepares a place for us. And, and when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he draws near to us. And then at the end of Psalm 23, David says these words, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. The word follow is the Hebrew word radaf, which means to hunt down, to chase down, to seek out to hunt down, chase down, and seek out. And what David is saying is, surely I know this, goodness, God's goodness and love will seek me out, will chase me down, will hunt me down all the days of my life. I shared a story several years ago, and I think it's kind of one of those apocryphal stories that's grown over time in, in pulpits, but, uh, but I'll, I'll share it with you anyway, because it really, uh, it makes a tremendous point. But uh, that this was in a Midwest city where there was a, a, an assault murderer, a, a, a man who would assault women and then murder them on the loose. And so everyone in town was on this heightened awareness and heightened alert, especially the women, as, as they had to protect themselves because this man was still on the loose. And, and so one particular woman leaves the mall toward evening, walks out to her car, gets in her car, and starts driving. And as soon as she closes the door, she notices a very intent, almost angry looking man in a pickup truck that's right behind her and pulls up right behind her and honks his horn a little bit and she's thinking to herself that first thing goes to her mind is oh my lord that's him that's him that's got to be him and she's thinking i've got to get away and so she starts to drive off and, and and sure enough the the pickup truck and the guy in the pickup truck just pursue and chase down this woman and she makes it to the interstate and he's still right behind her she gets on the interstate tries to lose this guy in the pickup truck but but he can't be lost and he continues to stay on her tail and he's looking even more intent even more angry as she looks at his face because there is this frustration on his face and he's and she's thinking, I've got to get away. I've got to get away. This must be him. She gets off of the interstate, pulls into a gas station, and as soon as she opens his door, her door, the guy in the pickup truck pulls up right behind and opens his door. She gets out of her car to run into the gas station where there are people. He gets out of the pickup truck, runs right up toward her, but instead of touching her, he opens the back seat of her car and pulls out a man that was crouched in the back seat. From his vantage point in the pickup truck, he could see what she did not see. From his vantage point in the pickup truck, he could see what hunted her truly. He could see what was after her, and he was trying to get her attention, and he was chasing her down, not with, not with ill intent, but with goodness and love. Chasing her down, hunting her, seeking her out in that way. That, that's what the word means. Some of us are here today, and, and, and let's get honest, we've been, we've been avoiding God. And, and we're avoiding God because we think he's seeking us out. Uh, and some of us are avoiding God because we think he's seeking us out with vengeance and wrath. That's not the God of Scripture. That's Zeus or Odin or Thor or one of those other gods. That's not, that's not the one true God. He hunts us down. He seeks us out with goodness and love. And, and that's the point, and that's what this woman discovered. Jesus went to seek her out, and instead of destroying her, he loved her. He hunts us down. He seeks us out all the days of our life with goodness and love. And if you have trusted your life to Jesus, understand that when you share your story with others, God's already seeking them out. All you're doing is sharing with them who, in fact, is seeking them out, who is knocking at the door of their heart, who it is that wants that relationship with them. And that's, that's what we do because we, once we have been changed by Christ, we now have a story. We now join him in his mission. Point number two in John 4 is this. He fills the emptiness of my soul. So Jesus answered. So, so they have this conversation, and Jesus says, will you give me a drink? And, 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 uh, and she kind of hesitates, and Jesus starts talking uh, about, uh, about water. And he, and he says this, everyone who drinks of this water, pointing to the well water, will be thirsty again. Verse 13, 
But, verse 14, whoever drinks of the water I give will never again thirst. Indeed, the, if they drink from this water, it will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, Jesus is saying, I am living water. You and I, we need natural water or we'll die. I mean, we can go a few days without water and then our bodies start to wither and we'll die. We also need water, water to be cleansed, to wash us. We also need water to satisfy us because if we go long enough without water, there is this deep inner longing in our bodies for water and everything is screaming for water. Have you ever been, have you ever been in a place where you have been close to almost, uh, almost death because you've needed water? And that feeling of thirst is, is, is really what Jesus says we have in our souls until we turn to him. Because without Jesus, spiritually, we won't survive. Without him, we can't be cleansed. Without him, we won't have the fulfillment. He says, I, I am this, this living water. But so many of us, this woman included, try to satisfy this eternal longing with something in this world, and we just wind up more empty. Uh, of the stories that came in last week, I'm going to pick up three and, and just want to read some of these to you. Here's what Here's what Stephen writes. I was raised in a Christian home, went to church until college, got into drugs and sex and everything else. I was deceived and selfish and pursuing pleasure. He says, I got stoned one Sunday morning and I was driving to Lowe's full of fear and conviction and I prayed, God help. Jesus showed up and I could feel his presence and I heard him say, follow me. Corey writes, I was an addict. I was addicted to drugs, sex, and the pursuit of happiness. I grew up around the things of God but, uh, uh, but those things, uh, I began to find myself fulfilling myself with those things in a dark place full of despair and hurt. I met Jesus on a night after I'd been on a drug binge, and I was probably close to going down a path of overdose of some kind. I remember God revealing himself to me, and I became spiritually awake. Uh, I repented and asked for God's forgiveness. Or, or, or Gingy in our church says, you know, okay, she wasn't down that road of filling the emptiness with, with pleasure and drugs and those things, but she says, I was proud and I doubted. Uh, and I was zeroing in on my deeds to count for my salvation. And then she says, I saw Christ and two college friends. This led to a long, miserable time of indecision. Then I finally admitted my pride and surrendered my life to Jesus, realizing it wasn't about me, but it was about giving up me to Jesus. And so what Stephen and Corey and Gingy are all saying is I was looking for the wrong things to satisfy this thirsting of my soul, but then I found him. And in him, I found what my soul longed for. He fills the emptiness of our souls. Point number three, he knows all about me and loves me anyway. Isn't that great? Listen to verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, so, so Jesus is, is, remember, Jesus is talking to this woman who was there at noontime, more than likely, and I, I firmly believe this, avoiding people. And so Jesus is talking to this woman who's there avoiding people, and he says, I've got a water that you can drink from, and you will never again thirst. And she's thinking, ah, a magical water, how cool. I can stay in my house the rest of my life. I will never have to interact with people the rest of my life. I imagine if I no longer longer have to go out of my house to this silly well to draw water. Imagine what life would be. Some of us kind of live there now, you know, just kind of withdrawn. She's thinking Jesus will help me withdraw from people. And Jesus says, no, you misunderstand me. Uh, she says, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here. Verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. What? So she's saying, give me that magical water, and Jesus says, go call your husband. What, what is he doing? But listen, verse 17, I have no husband, she replied. Uh, Jesus said, you were right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And you're looking at that, and you're going, what is Jesus doing? Why, why in the world is he pointing out 
that she's been married five times and she now, she's now living with somebody that's not her husband. And yeah, it was a big deal back then too. I mean, wh why is Jesus pointing that out? He's not shaming her, but notice they move from a conversation about this living water to husbands. Why? I firmly believe it's because that's what she's been looking to in order to fulfill the longing of her soul. She has looked to relationship after relationship after relationship, and she's now on her sixth relationship, trying somehow to fill and to quench the thirsting of her soul, and so Jesus is pointing to her need. And he's saying, L let me show you what your God replacement is. So let, let, let me show you what you're really turning to. And, and notice that Jesus doesn't reject her, or treat her like she's dirty. He treats her with respect. He, he, he loves her. He knows all about her and loves her anyway. Now, I want to say this because many of us are like this woman. And let's get really honest. We've done things that we'd be embarrassed if other people found out. And we feel dirty. And in our feeling dirty, we feel like, yeah, I, I, I think God probably doesn't like me much. You know, I, I think God probably, if he does show up, it's not going to be with goodness and love. It's going to be with vengeance and, and wrath. And he's going to look at me and say, you're dirty. Go clean up, you know, or something like that. But look at this. Here's the good news. Jesus knows all about us and loves us anyway. And he doesn't say go and clean up your dirt. He doesn't say that. He knows that we can't. He says, I have come to give you living water. What does water do? It cleanses. It gives life. He says, I, only I can do what you need done. And he's, he's saying, I can cleanse you from that dirt. I can cleanse you from this. I can wash you clean. Listen to Romans 5.8. Sean quoted it in the, in the worship time. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He, human love says, I will love you if. Uh, I will love you if you prove yourself. I will love you when you overcome this stuff that's holding you back. Uh, I will love you if and I will love you when. But God's love doesn't say I will love you if and I will love you when. God's love says I love you, period. As a matter of fact, I love you so much that while you were still my enemy and while you were still far from me in sin, I will give myself for you. That's love, and, and Jesus knows all about her and loves her anyway, and Jesus knows all about you and me and loves us anyway. Number four, Jesus uses me to bring the good news to others. Verse 39, skip ahead in chapter 4 to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Now, n notice what her testimony was. Her testimony was, Jesus told me everything I ever did. And you're thinking, well, what's the big deal about that? Uh, everyone in town knew everything she ever did. Here's, here's, here's why that was a big deal. He told me everything I ever did, and he's God, and he loves me anyway. And he's not repulsed by me. As a matter of fact, he's drawn to me. As a matter of fact, he seeks me out. As a matter of fact, he came out of his way to, for me? Uh, he, he loves me. He cares about me. I mean, this, this is her testimony. And she goes back to the very people she's been avoiding. <laughs> That's why she's leaving her home at noontime. She goes back to the very people she's avoiding, and, and she tells them about Jesus. And if you read the story, it says she leaves her water pots. In other words, the whole reason she went there in the first place no longer mattered. She now had a living water, and that was completely, completely revolutionizing of her life, and it was. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Verse 42, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you, were, of you have said. Now we have heard for ourselves and now we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Now, get how, how awesome this is. The disciples still don't even know that Jesus is the savior of the world, but the Samaritans somehow know. This woman knows, and the Samaritans know. They get it. The disciples are still trying to get it, but, but the Samaritans get it. I mean, get, get how important this is. And where did it start? It started with this woman's story. 
It started with her testimony. And, 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 it, and it just kind of snowballed from there. See, that's what happens when you and I begin to share our story. It, it just snowballs from there. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. God does something when we're open about our faith with others, and we start sharing this with other people. A lot of us are sitting here today and thinking, okay, pastor, I've, I've, got, uh, I've got a story, but I don't have a title, and I don't have a degree. Um, maybe, maybe I should leave that to the other people. Uh, absolutely not. You know, the, the, the Bible is full of people who don't have titles and degrees. That, that's, that's even a help sometimes, I think, to, to sharing your story. Or, or other people might say, but, but pastor, or I've got a past. Well, sometimes that even helps in sharing your story too, like this woman, because they see the drastic change in her. You see, it doesn't take a title. It doesn't take a degree. It takes an encounter with Christ. Uh, an experience of him changing our lives as we let him, as we open the door of our heart, let him do what he came at Christmas to do, and then we allow him then to lead us from that point on. So, do you have a story? If you don't have a story, I, 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 I want to end in just a moment by praying with you. And if you do have a story, uh, I want to also end by encouraging you. And so one of the two. But what was this woman's story? Well, before she met Christ, she was lost, lonely, empty, trying to fill the emptiness of her soul with all the wrong things. How did she meet Christ? She met Christ at noontime at the well. And, and here's what she discovered. He knew all about her but loved her anyway. And that changed her. Uh, and then what change took place in her life? Well, now the very people she was trying to avoid, now she was talking to them about the good news of Jesus. Now, now she had value and identity, not based on her goodness, because she didn't have a righteousness of her own. Now she had a value and identity based on the goodness and righteousness of Jesus. That changed everything about her. So what is your story? So if you don't have a story, what I want to ask you is, is, is Jesus still pursuing you? Is he still knocking at the door of your heart? Is he still wanting that relationship with you? Do you, do you want to turn and to say, Jesus, I, I need to be changed from the inside out? So if that's you, I, I just want to ask you, would you all just kind of join me in bowing your heads? And, and I, I, want to, I want to do this as, as you all bow your heads. If you need to make this decision to trust your life to Jesus, would you make eye contact with me and, and, and pray with me as we pray in just a moment? So Jesus, right now, what we're doing is we're asking for you to come into our life. And if that's you, just say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me. Uh, I'm, I'm like this woman. I've been trying to quench the thirsting of my soul with all the wrong things. I, I need you. I need what you came for. I need what you died for. Uh, I, I, need, I need your spirit in my life. Make me new. G give, me, give me a story. And now use me for whatever you would, just as this woman was used. Lord, I, I want you to, to use me and let me experience the joy uh, of, really, uh, of really being uh, being used for the reason why I'm created. Lord, revolutionize my life. Change me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And if you have that relationship with Christ, now you have a story. And let me urge you and encourage you to write your story out. If you want to videotape it, what we're doing is we're encouraging people to tape it. Maybe you tape it yourself. Stick it on Facebook or on social media. Uh, I mean, th this, this would be cool for your friends and others around you to see your story. And, and stick it out there for people to hear. Uh, be, be a part of the Saturday groups that are, that are sharing faith uh, and be a part of that as well. But right now, I want to call Nareth Meth up here, and we're going to hear Nareth, his story. And when I first met Nareth Math, I was thinking about his last name, and he introduced himself, and then he introduced his daughter to me as Crystal. <laughs> if you don't get it, he introduced his daughter as Crystal Math, and, and I thought that that was his daughter's last name, but, but that's not your daughter's last name. Your daughter's last name is Natalie. Her but, first name is Natalie. 
her, her, excuse me, her first name is Natalie. Um, Nareth, if you don't know Nareth, uh, perhaps cilantro taco, maybe if you've eaten there, if you know anything about that, Nareth and his family have that restaurant. But Nareth has a, an amazing story that I wanted him to share with us. And, and so I'm going to ask Nareth the same three questions that you will be answering in your cards. So, so Nareth, the first question is, what was your life like before Christ? Well, I was born in the 70s. I have a fake birthday, so I don't know when I was born. My, uh, uh, my birthday is 3373. I'm the third child. So my brother, 1171, and my sister is 2272. Here's the reason why. Uh, I was born uh, in the 70s, and then four or five years after that, uh, the killing field started in Cambodia. So uh, we were all separated. We were put in a uh, different concentration camp. And my camp, uh, I, I stayed with my mother, uh, my little sister, and my grandma. And we were in the concentration camp in uh, Persat. And so... Uh, so to, to explain for, for people to understand, Nareth, you... Um, you were probably roughly five, six years old, put in a concentration yes. camp in Cambodia by Pol Pot and his and his government, the Khmer Rouge, yes. in 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 Cambodia. And and how many? Just to give a bigger picture, how many people did the Khmer Rouge kill? Well, in, during that four years, uh, it is estimated anywhere from 1.7 to 2.5 million. Uh, Come up died. Bit. There we go. Um, they either <laughs> lost their life uh, in some type of starvation, executed, uh, uh, just many, many uh, ways of torturing. Uh, there's two movies that's made out. Uh, if if you want to find out about it more, um, The Killing Fields, of course, uh, 1984, and also uh, First They Killed My Father. And so. Yes, I was, uh, I was uh, in that camp. In that camp, I, I did lose my, uh, my mother, my little sister, and uh, the majority of uh, um, my aunts and my uncles. Uh, so they all uh, perished without some, some, at some point. You don't, you don't even know what happened to them. So a picture was taken of your mom, and we're going to show the picture up here on screen. And, um, and this picture of your mom that's, that's up there, you can look, that, that was taken when, when she was brought into the concentration camp with you? Yes, uh, that picture right there, was, uh, she was around 25. Uh, she, brought, she was brought in the concentration camp. And uh, I remember that day uh, when uh, uh, it was raining. Um, my little sister was sick. She was coughing for about a week, and uh, they went out and, and never came back home. And so uh, uh, I, I know for sure they're, they're deceased now. So uh, at one point, either uh, they were killed by the Khmer Rouge or, or they were killed in the act of doing something for the Khmer Rouge. So you were about six at this time. Uh, yes, sir. And so you were with your grandma in, in the concentration camp, and you were Buddhist at this point. Uh, yes, sir. The, the whole country, about over 90%, uh, um, everybody practiced Buddha. And so uh, there's a temple there, and if you can't, or you can't practice anything else or else you get killed. Uh, so... That's, that was uh, the religion at that time. So in, in the concentration camp, one of your jobs was, was uh, well, you had many jobs, but, but your, your food, I mean, you talk about getting the fish heads that the soldiers left and, and, making, and making soup with that, that, those fish heads. Yeah, we're, we're Cambodians, and so we eat uh, fish heads because it was left on the banks of the river, and they cut the, the head off, and they throw it into the banks, and we were collecting them, and that's how we survived for about that four years. That's you are correct. And so you, you made it from there to Thailand, and then to the Philippines, uh, and then to America. Yes, sir. Uh, 
we spent about uh, six months in the Kaodong uh, refugee camp. Then they transferred us to uh, a refugee camp in Manila, uh, Philippines, and where we applied for our paperwork, and, uh, and uh, we applied to Canada, to France, to Germany, and of course to the U.S., and the U.S. accepted us first, and that's why I'm here. So you were brought to California and, and relocated to, I guess, would it be called projects that are, that are yes. there? Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, the place is called Mini Street in Santa Ana, uh, California. Uh, there is an article that's uh, written uh, about that street. Uh, it's called The Fight uh, uh, for Mini Street. It's written by the Orange County Register. You can still uh, look it up. Uh, today. So here we have about five and a half blocks of concrete, uh, uh, 18 uh, apartments in, in each complex. So you have about five, five complex going this way and five uh, other uh, complex uh, on the opposite side. And um, 9,000 Hispanics, either illegal or legal, they're there and 3,000 Cambodian that are living uh, basically across the street from one another. And so uh, it, it's bad. Uh, there's drugs, there's uh, shootings, there's uh, just about anything that, that could happen uh, happened. And uh, that's where all these, uh, the gangs start uh, forming, like for example, the TRG, which is a Cambodian gang. The Asian Boy is also a Cambodian gang, and you have F Troop, Lopers, uh, the Cribs, uh, 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 the Cams. Uh, they're all they're all there too, and so we're just we're just trying to to survive, and uh, it, it it got so bad that that my wife. Uh, um, just taking out the trash with her friend, one of her friend got kidnapped. And so uh, all my friends were, were, were just either in some type of gangs or, or some, some type of trouble with the law or, 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 or they're killed there. And so that's, that's where we, we lived uh, when, we, when we're, uh, we moved from um, the Philippines. So how were you treated by others, being Cambodian and being a minority where you lived? Well, first of all, I, I, English is my second language. Uh, I speak Cambodian first. Uh, just not knowing the English language was difficult. Um, and learning it is very difficult. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I got in trouble a lot. And so... Uh, the, the, the law or the police department knows us very well. Uh, like, for example, um, in Cambodia, we wash our clothes outside. We don't have uh, washing machines, so I, me and my brother, go wash our clothes in the community swimming pool. Of course, the police was called, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we get detained. But we, we do stuff like that that's just uh, not normal here. So you, you talk about how most of your friends went into gangs, and, and, and many, I, uh, are, I'm assuming, are not alive now. Um, how were you able to avoid all of that? So in the middle of this chaos, um, there, there was a, a couple, uh, uh, a Caucasian uh, couple by the name of Dave and uh, Lisa Everett, they moved, we lived at 904 South Mini Street, apartment number seven, and they lived uh, across the street from us, uh, 825, apartment number six. So that's the picture we're gonna show up here yes. of Dave Everett and his family, right, right behind us there on a motorcycle in Cambodia, so yes. Big yes. And so them two uh, showed up living in this project. I mean, it was really bad. Uh, uh, and all of a sudden, you, you have two Caucasian that stick out like a sore thumb. You know, they're in the middle of nowhere. You're going to get killed. What are you doing? And uh, 
But they moved in, they bought some furnitures, and they, they, they stayed there for a good uh, three years. But during those three years, he really focused on the Cambodians. He, after school, he played ball with us. He, uh, Saturday and Sunday, whatever he can do, he, he wanted to participate in us, or uh, with us. And uh, just learning the, the, the Khmer uh, language. And uh, uh, I think after about a year and a half later, uh, he started uh, sharing Christ with us. So here, here are kids around uh, 13, 14 years old. We're playing basketball, and all of a sudden you got a Caucasian dude, guys, hey, I want to play. Uh, and it's like, wow, what are you doing? You know, and he started, we didn't accept him at first, but then he, he's, it, consistency, he just keeps on coming and coming and coming. It's like, wait, wait. So anyway, we, we finally accepted him and uh, uh, just, just hanging out with him each and every day. And I remember one, uh, one day the, after we played basketball, there was probably about five or six of us, and we went to his house and he, he gave us something to drink because it was... Uh, after a ball game, and he sat us down and and uh, he started talking about Christ to us. He shared uh, Roman uh, three twenty three with us that you know every one of us is, has sinned and fall short. And I'm like, well, uh, we're we're Buddhists, you know. We what's this? What's this stuff? And we start talking to him. I said, well, in Buddhism, we, we try to do good and only good. We, we work ourselves to get to nirvana. We, we, we try to stay away from bad stuff. And so then he hit us with another verse, Romans 6.23. And he says, the wages of sin is death. I'm like, well, we're all going to die. So, big deal. We're going to re get reincarnated. We're going to come back. And then he asked me, well, what are you going to do with your sin? In Buddha, or in Buddhism, we, we don't know what to do with our sin. I guess it carries with us through the next life or something like that. But then he told us that a lot of men tried to be God, but only one God became man, and that was Jesus Christ. Mm. And it, it, it's like, wow, okay, so what do we do with our sins? Oh. You know, I, the Bible states clearly that we, we're, we're sinners. He said, well, the Lord already paid for us. I said, what do you mean he paid for us? Well, when God became man without a blemish, he died on the cross to pay for our sin. Every sin is punishable. I'm like, oh, wow. So, what happened then? He said, not only that Jesus forgives your sin, but he calls you, if you accept him, he calls you a children of his. I'm like, wow. So, what happened then? Well, you go to heaven. So, I... My mind, you know, about 13, 14 year old, just kept on asking and asking and asking. I, I, I finally like, wow, okay, and, I, and I'm broken. I, I, you know, I've, 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 I've been through a war. Um, for the first three months that we landed here in the U.S., I would hear whistles, and I would jump off the the, the balcony and look for a foxhole somewhere. So it's like, wow, okay, what do we do now? And so I, I wanted to be close to my to my mother that I've lost. I, I want to be close to my little sister that I've lost. And I, I don't want to be reincarnated. 
And that's when I made that, that decision to accept Christ, to say, I want to be with my mom. I want to be with my sister in heaven, not being born something else or somewhere else doing whatever it is that uh, Buddha believes in. And I asked him, well, what do I need to do? Romans 10.9 tells us to profess with your mouth, put your faith in him, and you'll be saved. And that day after basketball, about four to five of us got baptized. Mm. And that was one of me. So for, for a lot of us, uh, go, going to church doesn't cost us anything, but it cost you something. What, what did it cost you to go to church because of your dad? Well, my father was, was imprisoned during the, the time of the, the camp. And so after that, I started uh, attending church, uh, Hope Christian Church, that's what it was called. And uh, I'm a young Christian, I, I, you know, I sit back there, and uh, my dad is very abusive. He, he, he doesn't spank you, he, he, he beats you. And so, you know, I, I wanted prayer, so I fill out one of those cards in the back there, and I put my name on there, Nareth Beth, my address, and then uh, uh, I said I needed prayer, undisclosed, just prayer. So back then in 80, I believe 86, 87, you know, we don't have much of uh, email or anything like that. It's done through mail, and I don't get texts and stuff like that. So a couple days later, I was at the house or the apartment, and a mail came. It was spelled N-A-R-E-T-H, and then instead of meth like the drug, it was spelled O-L-E-T-H. So it's a, a misspelled. And my dad looked at that. And he said, well, it looks like you've been Americanized now. You've changed your last name. He took the, uh, the cords, you know, these, those extension cord, and whooped me bad. And so, till this day, I don't fill any of those cards up because I don't know, my wife would beat me. <laughs> and so, you know, just asking for prayer here. You know, I got a good, good beating. And so, yeah, I, I'm scared about that card thing. You know, I don't, I don't do that. Don't worry about the cards. <laughs> Everything will be just fine. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's, uh, but uh, my dad was very, very abusive. And uh, I'll, uh, I, he beat me until I led him to Christ. So it, it, took a, it took a good five years, but he, he, uh, he gave his life to Christ. So we're, we're talking about changes. What change has God brought about in you? And, and I, I, I can honestly say I don't know somebody who has probably experienced the level of trauma that... that uh, I don't know many people at all who have experienced the level of trauma that Nareth has experienced, whether it was through, through the killing fields or whether it was through concentration camp or moving to Minnie Street and uh, um, having your arm broken, I guess, several times and, and things like that. Yes, because uh, we, we don't have uh, uh, clothes to wear when we came. And so it was pajamas, uh, whatever it is that your grandma can knit together or sew together in the camp, that's what we... We were different. Uh, our skin color, we didn't speak any English. Uh, we, we were thin because we've been starving for the last four years. And uh, we couldn't say anything about it because there's no communication skills that are, I couldn't say anything. If you gave me 10 bucks, and I don't even know what money was. So, uh, uh, so I'd show up at school, a lot of bullies. I've, my arms uh, twisted, broken, uh, been beaten. Just, just the society here. 
So I, what, what strikes me is you're not driven by that trauma. You're, you're, you're really driven by, by the forgiveness, even, even leading your father to Christ. And, and now you have a, a burden for, for others. Can you tell us about that burden? Yes. Uh, Christ changed me. Uh, he worked within my, my, myself uh, to, to forgive my father. So when I was watching the I Could Only Imagine movie, I was like, that's my life there. You know, I, I can re definitely relate to that. So I, I was able to forgive my father. And uh, my sister and my uh, other, told, uh, or other older brother have nothing to do with my, my dad. They, like, you know what, you beat me enough, I don't want to go get beaten anymore. So I, you stay where you are. I'll stay where I'm at. But for me, just, just Christ instilled this love that I have for my father. Even though he lives in California, I'm here in Florida, I still take uh, two to three times a year. I, I'd fly out to go see my father just to make sure he's okay. Um, I love my dad. I forgive him. I forgive him all the beating that he gave me. Um, I have hope for the future. The, the Buddha that I was stuck in for the first 12, 13 year, I will never see my mom again. I will never see my little sister again. I, I, I believe that I, I'm going to be reincarnated into something else. Or wherever I'm going to be at, I, I don't know. But this hope in Jesus Christ says that I'm going to be in heaven and perhaps my mother and my sister and all my family that, that got lost during the killing fields could also be there. That's the hope that I'm holding on. Thank you for sharing your story with us, Nareth. Uh, appreciate it greatly. And, Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for uh, br bringing us in on that. I, it, one last thing before we close. N Nareth has a, has a calling to Cambodians and, and will be over the next few years helping us lead some, some mission teams to, to Cambodia. And so uh, back, back to some of the same villages that you were from. And yes. so that's something that we're excitedly looking forward to as well. So Nareth Meth, let's, let's thank, thank him. All right, so just to close this out again, I just want to remind you one last time about the, the cards that you can drop here in the back in the giving boxes. Um, whether you want to be baptized, you want to get involved with sharing, or you'd like to, to have your, your testimony recorded. Um, if, if you are interested in stepping into this group, come and go, and you'd like to get involved with that, please do come and talk to me. I'll be up here in the front. I'd also love to pray with you if you're interested in that. Um, I'd like to invite our prayer partners forward as well. Just know that they'll be up here uh, to pray with you for any prayer needs you have. Um, and the, uh, oh yeah, also, newcomers, if you are new here and uh, you're wanting to just meet us a little bit and get to know us, we're going to have a newcomer reception back in the cafe, which is just out these doors to the left. So please do come and stop by with us for that. Um, so yeah, just one last thing. I'll close. Uh, if you guys could stand with me, I'll read a, a little verse for us real quick and uh, send us out with that. So this is Luke 1910. Thank you. <laughs> Luke 19.10, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So let, let us go with that same mission and that same vision and hope. Um, thank you so much. You guys have a great day.